afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, How to Build the Financial Foundation You Need to Secure Funding. Now, this is a really important topic because managing your finances, having a strong financial foundation, it's more than about funding. It's about good governance. It's about stewarding, you know, the income that you receive well. And with so many com competing priorities in your charities, in your churches, um, and all the day-to-day -day running responsibilities that you have, it can be really difficult to actually build those financial foundations and make sure that you have those financial processes in place. So on this webinar, we're gonna share some really important tips and insights to make that management process easier for you. So there are four fundamental reasons why you know, we wanted to have this webinar on this topic and why this topic is so important. Now, the first one is that so that your members and your donors know and can be confident in the fact that actually the money that they are donating is being managed and being stewarded well. The second important reason is the charity commission. Now, we all know that it's important to them that, you know, your accounts are in good, in good shape, that your, um, you know, that your finances are in good order. So that is uh, the, uh, a, another important reason. And also to secure funding, because in the times that we find ourselves in, securing funding is going to be really important for many of you. And last but not least, um, when you have a strong financial foundation, it makes it easier for you to increase income because you know exactly where you are. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first panelist, our head of finance, um, Patsy Alexander, who is really going to talk to you about and share some really important insights based on her t over 20 years of experience. Now, Patsy is a qualified accountant, like I said, with over 20 years experience helping organizations grow financially. She's a specialist charity accountant and holds an MSc in charity accounting and financial management. Welcome, welcome, Patsy. And I should have told you all, my name is Katrina Douglas and I am Head of Marketing for Good to Give. Welcome, Patsy. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Katrina. Welcome, everybody. I hope you find today very useful and helpful. Excellent. So the first question I have for you, Patsy, what do we mean by financial management and accounting? Because these are terms that, you know, we bandy around a lot, but a lot of people may not actually fully understand what, what they mean and what they are. Okay. Well, financial management is planning, <laughs> organizing and directing and controlling all your financial activities <laughs> of the charity. And by that, I mean responsibly managing the money coming into the charity and the money going out. Yeah. It is also ensuring that you have sufficient funds to, co to cover all your essential costs mm -hmm. and that the majority of the funds you receive into your charity are spent on your charitable activities. Now, accounting is keeping proper records of all the money received and how it is spent. Yeah. This can be done manually or using an online accounting package. Mm -hmm. Records should be kept up to date ideally as soon as the money comes into the charity and it should be recorded now i always advise my clients to maintain a cash book yeah. which is a simple list of the money coming in and going out and in date order yeah. a lot of my clients also keep a folder of all their receipts and all their invoices which can be used to reconcile to their bank account and this helps them when it comes near the end of the year when they have to produce accounts and yeah. it makes it a lot easier, at least then that way they won't forget what they spent the money on and yeah. where the money has come from. Excellent, excellent. So why is good charity accounting crucial, especially during these times of crisis? It's really crucial because during a crisis, there's less funding available. Mm. And some of your donors not, might not be paying as much into your, into your charity. So, and if you don't know how much money you've got available, and also what you need to spend on a regular basis, this could be quite problematic for you. And what you have, I have found in the, few, in, in the past is there's been a lot of charities where they haven't had sufficient funds even just to pay their rent. Yeah. 
Right. And of course, if you can't pay your core costs, that could be a problem for you where you might, might have to leave the building that you're in, for example. Yeah. Okay. So what is an independent examination? Right. Well, an independent examination is a form of external scrutiny, which is a regulatory requirement for all charities whose turnover is over £25,000. Okay. Now, the Charities Commission requires that a charity appoints an independent examiner. So that has to be someone that is not part of your charity. Right. And also, that person has to have some form of professional qualification. Okay. okay, so for our clients, Patsy, are we that independent examiner? That is correct. Okay. Now, Put a Gift are, are members of the Association of Charity Independent Examiners. Okay. And this ensures that we follow best practice for all our clients and we are kept up to date with all, our regula all the regulatory requirements. Okay. So, we can tell, so we can tell our clients what is, what is required from them. Okay, great. So, so if somebody's on this webinar and they, you know, have that income of over 25,000 and they yes. think, I don't know anybody who could do that, you can literally just come to us and we will be that intermediary for them. Almost definitely. Yeah. And if they, if they call um, the number at the end, I'm sure someone will get, put them in touch with the relevant person. Yeah. And it's very essential that you have, have an independent examiner. Yeah. If, your, if your income is over 25,000, I can't re repeat that because so many charities have got into so much problems because they haven't had their accounts independently examined. Yeah, no, that's really, really helpful. So if anyone has any questions um, throughout this webinar, please do pop them into the Q&A box and we will be sure to get back to you and answer them before the end of this webinar. So what are some of the things that funders look for uh, when it comes to uh, charity finances? What are they looking for? Um, yeah. yeah. Funders want to see that charities are keeping good financial records. Yeah. That they have a trustees who know how to run a charity. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean that they understand the requirements because the trustees are responsible for running the charity. Yeah. And so what funders would look at, they might look at your website, so they want to see whether you've got an accountant on your board, mm -hmm. whether you appoint accountants to do your accounts or bookkeeping, whether you've got legal advice, whether you've got marketing advice, whether you've got someone that can help you with the, your fundraising. Those are the sorts of things that um, funders would look at. And also they look, they look at your, they will look at your information on the Charity Commission's website to see if your accounts are up to date. So okay. it's very important that you keep your records up to date. A lot of people file maybe within a week or so before, mm -hmm. but what we do at um, Good To Give is we try to file accounts within three months of the deadline because right. that also looks really good. Funders are really impressed when you file your um, returns as soon as possible. Yeah. So I guess the people that you have on your team and in your organisation in senior leadership positions is really important, isn't it? So yes, it is. What are some tips for actually appointing trustees? What are some do's and don'ts? Well, the first thing to do is um, to have a diverse board so that it represents the people that you are, your, your charity for purposes. Mm. And the most important thing is to identify what skills you need. One of the things you can do is advertise because there's lots of voluntary organizations that allow you to advertise the volunteers that you require because you have to remember that trustees are volunteers. Right. So, but you have to make sure that the, the volunteers have the right skills. But if they don't have the right skills, you must ensure that your trustees are properly trained. And, right. and, can, and, they, and again, there's another thing that Good to Give does. They provide training for trustees so that trustee understands what their requirements are because this is a legal requirement and a lot of people don't realize the importance of having good trustees and really understanding what is required from you. So true, so true. Um, so are there any, before we move on to the next question, are there any things that you've seen over the years um, with trustees and that you thought actually that's a total no-no and that's like dangerous for your organization? Is there any kind of examples? Yes, um, in fact, a company that I'm working with at the moment um, the CEO um, is related to the one of wow. the trustees and that is a definite no-no because okay. all trustees have to be independent right. they cannot be re related okay. and, and also with trustees trustees are supposed to be volunteers so they should not be 
um, drawing any funds from the charity. And this is something that you must declare. And what I found in some of the accounts that I've looked at, that they, they are not declaring whether the trustees are receiving funding or income or not. And this is something that you have to have to declare. Okay. So these are a couple of things that I would say a no, no. Okay, great. So what are some common mistakes that you see churches and charities make when it comes to financial management? Not keeping any records, not really understanding the importance of keeping financial records. And so the problem with that is there's a huge risk of fraud and the fraud does happen. And also having um, the correct authorities in place because trustees, as I've said before, you are responsible for your, your the overall responsibility for all your finances. So you have to know, you have to be sure that you understand what's coming into your charity and what's going out. Right. Because you, ca you cannot de delegate that authority to someone within the charity. You are yeah. ultimately responsible. Okay. Anything else? Any other mistakes that you've, you've seen churches and charities uh, make when it comes to financial management? Um, another thing is probably not really getting the right expertise. Mm. So, for example, there's a lot of charities that don't even realise that they can claim gift aid. Yeah. And they don't report that correctly. So as a result of that, uh, they are entitled to a lot more income, but they're not receiving that. Yeah. And, and also, again, funding, because there's so much funding out there for charities, but a lot, of, a lot of churches and charities are not aware of that, so they don't apply for that. And again, yeah. this is another area where Good to Give can help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for those of you that uh joined on early you would have seen our trailer and you can see the scope of services that we actually offer and later on in the webinar you're going to hear from des our co-founder um who will speak to you about gift aid and also we have a whole head of funding um that can actually support you with that so literally when it comes to enhancing your charity and helping it grow we literally leave no stone unturned um so yeah just just to make you all aware of that um so um, you've spoken about this actually already. So the role of trustees when it comes to good financial management. So, you know, generally the trustees are, uh, you know, responsible for the charity, but specifically in relation to financial management, are there any responsibilities that they have? Yes, they have to ensure that no fraud takes place. They have to ensure that the money comes coming in from their donors and from the funders are spent on their charitable activities. Right. That is the most important thing. They have to understand um, the accounting records. They have to be able to tell if, for example, a funder said to them, so how much money did you get in this, this year? They have to be able to say, oh, we got X amount. And what did right. you spend it on? You have to be able to tell them what you spent. You cannot say, oh, I don't know. I'm going to ask my treasurer wow. or I'm going to ask someone. It is your responsibility. It is that serious. And, and they have to ensure that the correct procedures and policies are in place to ensure okay. that the, the, the money is properly managed. Okay, so they ha is it true that they have to attend a certain amount of meetings, trustee meetings a year? Yes, they should have ideally at least once, one every three months, so probably at least four a month. And when, okay. you, when you recruit trustees, you, one of the things you have to say to them is, it's commitment is very important yeah. that certain papers will be sent out for example what i advise all my um, clients is to have regular meetings and have someone in place where they can produce a management account which can be reviewed by the trustees at least on a quarterly basis i also sit on several boards and sometimes it's quite onerous process where you, you receive a lot of papers that we have to review but it's essential. And then there is someone who comes along and explains the, the finances. As an accountant, I understand the finances because I, I, I sit on boards that are small and medium. But it is essential that you understand finances, you understand the figures. So if, if, if for example, the charity is making a loss, why is it making a loss? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the charity spending the money on? Why is it spending on, on certain things? Who authorised that expenditure? Who has authority to make payments? These are the things that the trustee must, must be aware of. Yeah. So at any, because, and also one thing to be mindful of is what the Charities Commission is now doing, it's actually randomly selecting charities and visiting them 
you right. wouldn't know when they're coming along. They might give you a couple of days notice and they might say, I'm coming along to have a look at your records. So one of the things they will look at is your cash books. They'll also look at your bank, your bank statements. They'll look at your checkbooks because they want to make sure that you are properly managing the, the charity's money yeah. that is coming in. Yeah, and I know for a lot of charities, this might uh, sound somewhat daunting, all the responsibilities that you have, I guess. And that's why, you know, it's so important to us that we support charities and churches because we totally understand that. But it doesn't change the fact that you still have responsibilities. All of these things still have to be in place um, and they cannot be brushed under the carpet because they will catch up uh, with you, you know, which is why, you know, we, we really experience of dealing with church and charities and you know we provide all the support that you actually need and while we're even having this webinar um we, we can great. answer all your questions here so fully take advantage of this opportunity because like i said patsy has 20 odd years experience she sits on boards this is what she does day in and day out and you don't you would often have the opportunity to ask someone like patsy questions so please do pop your questions in uh the box so um if a charity can't afford to hire a qualified accountant, what should they do? Well, that is difficult to say because when you say you can't afford to um, hire qualified accountants, it really, again, you have to look at your income. So if you're earning an X amount of money, you have to put aside a, a percentage for your governance, which yeah. will include independent examination. So the first thing I would do is someone said to me, I can't afford an accountant. I would have to look at what they're spending their money on and right. why they can't afford someone. They might not necessarily need to have someone to do all their bookkeeping and their records keeping, but they do need to have an independent examination if their income is over 25,000. If it's over a million, they need to have an audit, and which is a lot more expensive. Mm. So this is essential things that you cannot say, oh, I can't afford it. Mm. Because you couldn't go to the Charities Commission and say, <laughs> I couldn't afford to independently examine. I couldn't afford to, to appoint someone that you say I have to appoint. Yeah. So this is something to be mindful of. That is, that is a really good point because so often we probably think that these things are a choice that we have. And actually it isn't. If you have a charity, no. it's, it's not even a question. Mm. It's things that have to be done. So, mm. um, yeah. No, and, and, and also, yes. And also what you've got to remember, it's public funds. Mm. When, you're taking, when you're taking money from someone else, whether it's from a donor or from a funder, this is public money. And you're, as trusted, you're accountable. You have to be accountable for that money. Yeah. And also the fact that you're appointing someone that is qualified to independently scrutinize and review what you are doing with that money gives assurances and trust yeah. to your, the external bodies and your stakeholders. Yeah, such, such good, imp uh, good and important point. So talk to us about record keeping, Patsy. What is record keeping? Um, and why is it important? Okay. So, so for me, as an accountant, record keeping is something that's simple and okay. something that's easy to do. And other people find it daunting, but it really isn't daunting. It's yeah. simple, a record of what, you, what money comes in. So for example, if someone gave you a check for £25,000, mm. all you would need to do on a piece of paper, put the date, Say for the 1st of August, 2020, someone gave me a check for 20,000 pounds. And if it was, for example, from a funder, say John Lyon Trust, mm -hmm. and then you'd say, I got 25,000 pounds. So the next thing then you'd have to do is say, well, what am I going to do with that 20? Why have they given me that 25,000 pounds? As a charity, they might say, I'm giving you that 20,000 pounds to help you pay for your administration mm -hmm. and your independent and, your, and part of your governance training, for example. So then what you have to do then is throughout the year, you have to keep a separate record of everything that you spend. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you employ a administrator and part of that funding is that you can pay the administrator 5,000 yeah. pounds and you pay them say, for example, 500 pounds a month. So you make a note, I've paid this person 500 pounds. I've spent X amount on rent. I've spent X amount. So you know exactly, so when the funder comes back to you and say, how have you spent my £25,000? You can tell them. That is what record keeping is. I love Simply that. Simply listing what you've spent the money on and what money has come in. I love how simple you make that because so often when it comes to finances, it's so complicated in our head, but actually it's so simple. And, you know, it doesn't have to be this, you know, lots of systems, 
and, and lots of technology to record these yeah. things. I love the fact that you've literally just said it's a simple of documenting, you know, what it is, where it came from. You know, I love that. It's yeah. so, you make it so simple. So that's so good. And so why do charities need good processes? And I know that you kind of touched on this on a, on a, a lot of the questions that you've answered so far, but you know, why, why do charities need processes? Why can we not just, you know, do what we do and in any way that we want to do it? Why does it need to be formulated like this? Again, having processes is a regulatory requirement. Yeah. So one of the things the Charity Commission expects us to have is good processes mm. so that everyone in the charity understands what is required from them. Yeah. So these processes explain to you, this is what you should be doing. So for example, safeguarding. This is a policy that has to be followed. And when you have processes in place, you can see what's working and what's not working. Yeah. And what should happen is trustees should come together at their meetings and, and review those processes and, and say, are we up to date in our processes? That's why it's so important to look at the Charities Commission um, website, speak to your independent advisors if you're not sure what you should be doing. And, and understand what policies and procedures you should have in place. Yeah. And then when you look at them, you can see, yes, I'm following this one. No, I'm not doing this. What should I be doing? And then also when you bring people into your um, charity, part of the induction should be going through those processes. So okay. they also understand what is expected from them. Yeah, that's so good. And I think what I'm picking up from a lot of what you're saying is, if you have these things and you do them as you go and as they happen, you're recording it, you don't have this big backlog of work to do at exactly. the end um, because you're keeping on top of it as you go. And I guess processes yes. are a really big and important part of that. So can you give us a few processes that every charity or church should have? Yes. So one of the, the first thing is good accounting records. Mm -hmm. So you should outline what that means so that will, will say for example um who can authorize payments um how the records are going to be kept whether you're going to have an online system or whether you're going to be manually keeping your records if you're going to produce at monthly or annual reports if you're going to produce management accounts the different items that need to go to your board meetings yeah. So you would have a schedule of um, all activities that need to be carried out. You would also say for in your processes, on your procedures, you would say when trustees should meet. You would also have inductions. You would yeah. also have training. You would also have up-to-date meetings. For example, fundraising is another thing. If you need to fundraise, do you need to send people on, on training? One of your, your, your procedures might be that anyone who works on the fundraising should have a certain amount of experience. Also, how many trustees you should have, yeah. whether you should have, and, what, and what's quorum to make um, decisions. So this is where you need to list all your, your processes and your procedures so that you understand what is required to run a charity. Excellent, excellent. And my last question that I have for you, Patsy, is what is charity governance and why is it important okay so charity governance really relates to the trustees and running a charity right because ultimately the trustees are responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the charity mm -hmm. and as a trustee you have to understand what that means so good governance is when a charity is run properly that okay. means that trustees come together regularly they keep up to date with all the changes and all the regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. They understand the financial commitments and the requirements of the charity. And then they, they will then make the decisions as to how best to grow the charity, run the charity, operate the charity, who is responsible for carrying out the duties of the charity, who they can delegate. They can delegate some of their authorities, okay. but they cannot delegate all their authorities. Right, okay. So good governance is really understanding the roles and responsibility of a charity. And also, this is something that Good to Give can help because we yeah. carry out training for trustees. Yeah. That is great. That literally, in the last 25 minutes, everything that you've shared has been so rich and so valuable. So thank you so much, Patsy. Um, You're welcome. But 
you know, one other area that is important when laying a financial foundation for your charity and securing funding um, is gift aid. In fact, it's the first place that you should look. So I'm going to bring on Des Stewart, our co-founder, who has more than 25 years of experience working in the private and public sectors. Having worked exclusively in the third sector for over a decade, he is an expert in the field of gift aid compliance and governance. Welcome, Des. Welcome, Des. Really looking Hi. forward to uh, picking your brain about gift aid. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Katrina. Hi, Patsy. Um, always, a, always a pleasure to, uh, to join on these, uh, these webinars. Yeah. So, Des, first question. What is gift aid? Right. Well, um, gift aid, simply put, is a, is a tax efficient means of increasing your church's or charity's income by up to 25%. And as you, you know, you initially mentioned, it's got to be the first place to start when looking at fundraising. And, and in our experience, and, uh, you know, if you talk to, to Dominic, who heads our fundraising, he will often say to you that grant makers are often interested in, in how well you are able to achieve uh, extra income, not just by what they're giving you, because they may only give you a grant for maybe a, 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 a period of time, maybe for one year or just for one project. But you know what they want to know is, and as well as the Charities Commission is, how are you going to sustain yourself uh, as a charity or as an organisation ongoing? So it's about charities being resourceful. And the first place to go is looking at gift aid. Yeah. It's got to happen. Excellent. So why should all churches and charities be claiming? Because I know we hear some churches and charities say they don't want to. So why should they all be claiming gift aid? to say um, I personally have come across churches who will say to me that um, you know they don't claim gift aid because they want to leave that money with the government or or and I'll tell you another uh, thing that they often say some some will say is they don't actually want to to claim the money because they'd rather not have the charities commission or the revenue come and look at their charities and you know un unfortunately and I have to, unfortunately, you could probably hear some drilling above me right now. So please, please forgive that. It was quiet through the whole time that Patsy was talking. <laughs> as soon as I come on the line, it just start the drilling starts. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll try and get through this. But, but, but I just want to say that for those churches who think in that way, I'll, I'll give this a chance to go. Mm -hmm. Right. For those churches that think in that way, that they don't want the authorities to come in and look at them, from the minute you are collecting public donations, what mm -hmm. Patsy referred to as public money, mm -hmm. you're under scrutiny anyway, okay? Um, so the reason why churches should be claiming, because for me, it's, it's good stewardship. It's about mm -hmm. making more from less. Yeah. It's, it's you know, your, your, your donors are supporting your cause, and if those donors are tax-paying individuals, then rather than allow the tax that they have paid, which will just go to the government and whatever the government decide they want to spend it on, why not allow that to come into your charity to help you with the aims and objects that you've set out? For me, it's about being good custodians of the funds that come into your church and to your charity. Yeah. And I think it's incumbent on the, um, on the trustees to ensure that they're, they're making more from less and doing the best that they can financially. Absolutely. And we were talking about this the other day, weren't we, Des? Like 750 million <laughs> goes unclaimed like that is flabbergasting to me like it's crazy yeah it's it's it's, it's absurd it's absolutely mm -hmm. absurd you're, you're right about that millions and millions of pounds um and goes unclaimed yeah wow wow so um talk to us about um retrospective claiming what does that mean first of all okay so uh Retrospective claiming is a process by which HMRC allow your charity to uh, claim for up to four years in the past. So on donations or, or gift aid claiming that you have not done for four years, you can go back and claim uh, that same money. So you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be out of pocket uh, on, on donations that you hadn't claimed on in the past.
Okay. Um, and are there any kind of restrictions to that or no matter what, you can always just go back and claim for up to four years? Well, no, no you, you must have all of the qualifying information that allows you to be able to do that. Um, so for instance, where, where individuals had made donations uh, and you had not claimed, you must have the record of the donation itself you must have a declaration, which and the declaration is an agreement by the individual ta UK income taxpayer who okay. is going to allow your charity to actually make those those uh, those claims. Right, yeah. right. OK, uh, in fact, um, sorry, I'm just going to say, you know, when you when you mentioned about uh, you mentioned earlier on about, you know, 750 million pounds worth of gift aid unclaimed, that typically is, a, is, a, is an annual value. Um, mm -hmm. at HMRC and various organizations that measure that, like the National Audit Office. Um, and if, if you think about the four-year retrospective claiming cycle, that's 750 million each year over four years represents in the close to three billion, three billion plus worth of unclaimed donations mm -hmm. over a four-year retrospective claiming period. And so many of our, our, our charities and churches fall foul of that. Um, and there's really no need for it. Yeah, yeah. So what is the gift aid small donation scheme? Okay, so I, I really have to apologize for the drilling that, <laughs> that you're hearing at the moment. Hopefully it's not um, too disconcerting, but the gift aid small donation scheme uh, relates to claims that you can make on donations where you don't have uh, the uh, a gift aid declaration. Uh, it's Typically, you must be using, however, what we just spoke about, which is the traditional gift aid scheme. So if you're using traditional gift aid, then you can use the gift aid small donation scheme. And the way it works is you can typically claim on cash donations for which you have none of the prerequisite uh, information that you would need under the gift aid, traditional gift aid scheme. So if you have cash donations of 30 pounds or less, or as of uh, the 6th of April 2019, you have donations, again, £30 or less through contactless giving. So, you know, people who go up and they give with their, their credit card or their debit card, um, you can actually claim gift aid on that using the gift aid small donation scheme. You can claim up to £2,000 worth of gift aid um, since April 2016 or prior to that date you'll be able to claim up to £1,250 uh, in some of those earlier years. Okay. Okay. So how does the Good to Give gift aid management process work? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. All right. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, our service, um, the idea is that we aim to look at all the multiple um, different ways in which you actually get donations into into your charity. Um, so for instance, if you're using our, I'll speak uh, candidly just about our, our service. Um, we look at, we look at envelope systems. So you might get cash donations by way of envelope systems, uh, receipt books, tithing cards. Um, you may have bank transfers where individuals are making tithing donations directly into the bank. Mm -hmm. um, we, there are, you know, credit card payments. And if you are if you are one of our, our clients, then you'll have access to our digital platforms, which is uh, uh, our digital donation platform and also the website through the microsite. So we look at all the different ways in which you could be getting donations into, your, I mean, even, even spreadsheets. We'll take spreadsheets mm -hmm. as well, okay? So the idea is that we try to make it as easy, as humanly easy as possible um, yeah. for the client to be able to get that information into our system. And our, we've got a fantastic team that will go through that process and, and advise our clients. Um, the idea being is that when that information comes in, uh, our system, so we use something called optical mark and optical character recognition, so that there's an automated process that checks the data in the first instance. And then our analysts do second and third level checking and really scrutinize the donations, making sure that you know, no stone is left unturned and that if there is claiming to be done, we're, we're doing that claiming for, for the client and, and doing it in such a way that, you know, for us, the, 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 we don't want our churches to to be any, in, in reproach of, of any um, rules or, or breaking any guidelines. So, you know, make sure that those things are done well is is very essential. 
Um, and once all those levels of checks are done, then our system basically does, you know, it, it claims on, on, the, on the data. If for some reason there is any data that our system hasn't claimed on because it maybe doesn't have all the prerequisite information, then our system will, will hold on to that data until such time as there is a, an opportunity to claim on that. Okay, excellent. So, you know, what are the benefits? You've spoken about them already, but what are the, the benefits of using our service? You know, we've been doing this for over a decade. So mm. what specifically, and, and endorsed by HMRC, might I add. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, which, which was big for us because when we initially, when we initially came about with the idea of this service, you know, um, myself and, and the other co-founder, Corey, Corey Belfon, sat down and sort of had a, a blank sheet of paper over with what was our idea going to be. Um, we said, when we came up with the, the gift aid process, we said, well, look, we must have it certified or ratified by the revenue because they are the senior adjudicators of such a of such a system and um, so when the system when we developed and designed the system we actually got hmrc in very first to check it and what they said was as far as they were concerned 95 percent of the faith-based organizations should really be using using the service that we provide um, so you know when we look at the the benefits well we're talking about maximization of every penny yeah okay? um, and we're talking about retrospective claiming not just not and and when we talk about retrospective claiming although the in the first instance we think about going back four years in reality retrospective claiming is an ongoing process mm -hmm. because as you move from as you because you can only do four years but as you move into a new year the oldest of the four years drops off so you can no longer claiming that year now why i say it's an ongoing process is because you will be receiving donations throughout the year and uh, something I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go into any detail on when I spoke about the retrospective claiming earlier is individuals make donations, and those, and some of those donations don't have all of the prerequisite information that allows you to be able to claim on it. Mm -hmm. Now, you can use the gift aid small donation scheme to claim on donations where you don't have all of the information, but that's only up to a level of thirty pounds and only up to two thousand pounds worth of potential claiming, mm -hmm. right? However, there will be times where someone may have donated, I've gone to a church before now, or, gone, or donated £100 to a charity, and may not have actually um, given them all of my information just because of the way they collected the information, to allow them to be able to claim on that gift aid. Mm -hmm. However, the way our system works is if that same situation happened with one of our clients, so I'd gone to maybe a church program, donated £100, said that, yes, it was Destuil who donated it, and left, they wouldn't be able to claim on that donation. But if I come then in the future, a year or there's another program from now, and it's within the four year retrospective claiming period, and I now give more information, our system will, 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 will take the new information and actually go through the catalog of data that it has kept over the years to try and match the new information with old information to allow us to be able to claim. That allows you to claim yeah multiple times in any in any period as long as it is a fresh new donation that you're claiming on okay which is another benefit of of our system multiple claims so yeah. rather than waiting until year end or some point into the new year before such time as, as claiming our system will be claiming multiple times throughout the year which means right. our clients get their money up front more faster rather than waiting for you know six or eight months after year end, you know, um, you know, that for me is, is you know, your money needs to be in your pocket now, not, not to mention peace of mind. And, and like, like I've mentioned before, it's been ratified by HMRC. So our churches and charities that we work for can safely focus on the objectives that they have set and, um, and, and don't worry about maximizing because our system's taking care of it and our team. Yeah, amazing. So, um, what are some common errors that you see churches make when it comes to gift aid? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, said that Okay, again. what are some common errors that you hit that you see churches and charities make when it comes to gift aid? Okay, so um, I've seen where churches have been overzealous and claiming more than their income would even allow, mm. and that's handed them in problems with HMRC. 
Yeah. I've seen, I've then seen churches who do the absolute opposite to that because they're so frightened of the, the situation they feel they could find themselves in, and they call yeah. it the hot water with HMRC, where they totally underclaim, mm. uh, based and, and again based on the the income that they have coming in. For me, it's about get the right people to do the right job to get the right result. Yeah, yeah maybe I like that. I <laughs> and, like that. Uh, and, you know, if you're doing that, you don't have to worry about those things because, like I said, for us, we don't want to find the churches or, or charities beyond reproach and doing things that are wrong, which is why we have so many levels and layers of checks. Mm. But, um, but underclaiming is just as bad, in my opinion, as overclaiming. Yeah. Mm. Um, obviously, the, 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 the result is different, but, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately claim what is what is rightfully yours. You know, yeah. give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and exactly. you know, for concern, Caesar has made a way whereby he's saying, look, I'm happy to, to give you back mm -hmm. um, some of the, the, the donations or that, 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 you know, or tax in relation to the donations that have been made. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are key things. And I think also the where, where there's a huge problem is and I where I spoke about getting the right people often the churches think they're saving money by just having you know a few volunteers or people who are ill-equipped to be able to do the job of mm. gift aid of even accounting mm. you know they they you know Patsy made a great point earlier on about making sure that you have an independent examiner because they're going to spot things that you can't spot yeah. They're going to be able to see things that you don't see. And those are sometimes the things that are pitfalls that will really play around with your ability to raise the types of funds that you need to raise. Yeah. Um, so uh, in, in response, and, you know, today we're talking about, you know, making sure your finances are in the right place to make sure that you are funding ready. Um, you know, it's something that, our, you know, our churches and charities certainly have to look at and take seriously. Yeah, absolutely. So before I get to uh, live questions, Des, can you tell us a little bit about the Good to Give roadmap? Yep, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's something that we, I mean, you know, we've got these fantastic services that, that have been set out there from charity registration and compliance through to finance and all of that great stuff and fundraising and GDPR and gift aid. Um, and each one of those, if you like, is an umbilical cord linked together that, that if you like, forms a placenta that a, a charity can just lean on and suck from, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's too graphic an explanation, but, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's about sustaining life and making yeah. sure that the life that you're trying to sustain actually can reach its future potential. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're, we aim to do here. So for us... Our, our Good to Give roadmap is a, is a process by which our clients are actually able to reach their full potential and their goals. Now, often you might have some real simple goals. It might be, well, I'll say simple, but it may be that you want to uh, have a, a place where you can either lease or mortgage or, or you've got a number of projects for which you want to, to raise um, grants for and go to grant makers. So you say to yourself, right, how do I make myself attractive to those entities that in essence I really want to be able to help me and sometimes uh, uh, often you know uh, clients and potential clients haven't necessarily thought about what the the net effect of them not necessarily having their uh, a, a, a roadmap towards their goals yeah. you know uh, and, and and so we'll not think about some certain things to, to help them with that so what we aim to do with our specialists uh, amongst them, you know, Patsy, Dominic, um, teams like that, is to help uh, our, our clients come in and we'll, we'll pretty much talk about what they want to achieve. And what we do is look at the time span and say, right, you potentially could achieve this over this time span, but these are the individual milestones that we need to go through to get you from where you are now to really where you want to be. Now, it mm -hmm. could well be that, uh, um, and we've had this where, where a, a, a particular client has come into us, their accounts have always been late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had to then turn around and say, right, you need to start getting your, your accounting um, governance, you know, to look at the, the, the financial controls that you, that, you know, that whoever's going to be a grant maker and want to give you, they want to know that you've got good financial controls in place. Late accounts just shows bad financial controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It shows that nobody's in control of, of what's going on. 
So we've then had to put you know, a plan together to make sure that things are delivered right. So using our accounting service with our service delivery managers uh, and monitor, we've been able to sort of work with, with these clients to be able to put them on the right road. And sometimes it will take time. Other mm -hmm. times it could be a lot shorter, but it's about milestones to achieve, you know, uh, where you, the, the, the path that you want to get to, the future that you see for yourself. And that's really what the roadmap is all about. Amazing. So why anyone on this call thinking about, you know, they have a goal, an objective for their church or charity. Why should they be getting in contact with us and signing up for this roadmap? Or getting on board with this roadmap? Sorry, you, you were asking me a question, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Des. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I started to read something. Yeah. Sorry, you might want to ask that again. <laughs> yeah, sure. So before I take the live questions, yes. why should anybody on this webinar who has a financial goal of any kind or wants to grow their charity or church in any way, in a nutshell, why should they be getting on board with our roadmap? Because the roadmap is going to, like I said, it's a number of milestones to, to reaching the goal. Now, mm. what you often find, I say often, but with the whole work church life balance that, that ministers, trustees, um, those who have been entrusted or powers have been devolved down to, to make decisions and, and so on. Often what you find is that, and especially from the church's point of view, and I, I'll speak from that point of view, where there is a real spiritual um, drive and, and and really everything is is led towards you know winning winning souls for the kingdom mm -hmm. and not not necessarily looking at the the more secular requirements of right you know what we're going to do in terms of our public benefit and helping people within the local community and we now want to get funding for this thing which maybe we really have a desire to help uh, people in the in the local community but they haven't necessarily had a real community focus before now or mm -hmm. a strategy for getting there that's where we come in and can really help. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've got some people that, and, and professional people who can bounce ideas off of, you know, who you can bounce ideas off of. We can put together a roadmap for you and help you to achieve your goals. And that's, that's really what it boils down to. We've got years and years of experience. Dominic has been doing fundraising and working within that sector for the best part of nearly 30 years, although he looks mm. like he's about 10. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, yeah. You've, you've got Patsy, who's got years and years and years and years yeah. of experience. I mean, so knowledgeable that it's a joy sitting down and just talking with her and learning all the time. Yeah. You know, um, from a technology standpoint, gift aid standpoint, charity compliance, everything is right here. We, yeah. you know, in my opinion, and you know, we've got to be the partner of choice. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a, a a nice place to segue into the live questions, and I have a few. So. Uh, Tony is asking, we are starting to receive online donations for which there is a small charge from PayPal. Do we claim gift aid on the gross donation or the net donation? You claim gift aid on the gross donation. Okay. Okay. Nice Excellent. and simple. <laughs> nice and simple. Nice and simple. Okay. So Angela Walker is asking, what skills does a trustee require? I understand accounts any other skills so patsy you, if you just unmute yourself patsy mm -hmm. apologies yeah it really depends on the charity and what um objectives that you carry out so for example if your charity works with children you would have to have people on your board that understand the different um, roles that are required so for example you would have safeguarding if you were dealing with vulnerable um, clients other policies that you will need to understand is like data protection policies. You'll also need to have things like financial reserve policies, um, legacy policies, equal opportunity policies. So there's lots of different policies depending on what your objectives are. Okay, great. And then another one um, for you, Patsy. Um, so Angela is saying, you mentioned the safeguarding policy. What yeah. are we safeguarding? So again, if, if you're working with vulnerable clients, whether it's children, elderly, disabled, you have to have a safeguarding policy to ensure that you protect those, those vulnerable adults. And for example, within your safeguarding policy, you might have um, where everyone who works with um, a vulnerable client has to have a, an enhanced DBS. 
and that is a, um, a certificate that I'm, it, I'm not sure if you know what a D DBS is, but it's a requirement that you have to have if you work with a vulnerable client group. Okay, and is that, is that embedded in legislation? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Because, okay. because what, what, that's the other thing that if you're um, applying for funding for a particular, so for example, if you work with children and you're applying for funding, one of the things the funders will ask is, have you got a safeguarding policy? And, right. and sometimes, a lot of the times they want to see your safeguarding policy. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, can you name the different types of, oh no, you've done that already. Can you name the different types of policies required for a church? Are there any specific, mm. yeah. Yeah, you've done that already. Are there any that are, I guess, specific to churches or just generally they need to have the ones that you mentioned? Yeah, well, for churches, there's a church, church worker code of conduct okay. that you're supposed to follow as a church. Okay. So, and, and also um, the things like data protection, because obviously you're, you've got people's info, people, and that applies to all charities. But there's certain things specific to churches, like the church worker code of conduct. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, okay. just, 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 to, just to add to that, and this is, you know, glad uh, Patsy touched on that in respect of um, the in, in Information Commissioner's Office around GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, clients uh, and, and, you know, all churches should really go to um, the ICO.org. ICO and actually there's a test that you can take up there. So it takes no more than a, 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 maybe a minute or two. And it yeah. will determine whether or not you actually need to be registered uh, as somebody who is deemed a data collector, because data is a huge thing now. You, you imagine you've got young people, you've got vulnerable adults coming, you've got members, you've got volunteers whose information you keep. Um, you have a whole rafter of information that you're holding on to, and uh, you need to make sure that you are holding on to that data within the confines of what is now the law since 2000, May 2018, um, when GDPR and GDPR requirements became lawful. Okay, so it's certainly something to think about. And just remember, churches are just like any other organization where you are managing people and looking after people. So lots of the policies and things like that, that Patsy's talking about, whether church or otherwise, um, as well as the church code of conduct, which you certainly need to go through. Um, it's, you know, these are, these are important bits of information, not, not least to, to um, consider when you're uploading your, your charity accounts at year end, there are certain ones that the Charities Commission will, will ask you for. So like, do you have this policy or do you have that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So um, from Susanna, what does it take to have an accountant with Good to Give? What does it take to have an accountant? Okay, so how do you become a, a, a Good to Give client? Um, or, or what I, is it? I believe that, that would be my understanding of it. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's straightforward. Uh, you just, I'm sure having been on this webinar here, uh, certainly one of our, our, our uh, what we call our charity advisors would be in touch uh, and they would explain the process of how we manage accounts for clients, um, including the, 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 what we call the client onboarding process, which is um, just in terms of us understanding who the trustees are, um, you know, letting them know what our pricing requirements and would, would be after we've done a bit of an assessment on, on their previous year end. Um, and also how we would uh, onboard that client by way, and Patsy touched on the type of training that we do. Um, it's more awareness for trustees and, and letting trustees understand their obligation uh, being, you know, charity uh, trustees which is really important because, you know, things like, you know, things being late and uh, tardiness of any fashion really doesn't bode well. And uh, we're only as good as the clients we work with because if they take long to send information, then, you know, unfortunately that, that becomes an issue. So that's how we would look to um, onboard a client. Okay. Yeah, excellent. So. Uh, Jervis is asking, what are the key governance documents that our church charity should have in place? Okay, if I just give you an example of some of the things for governance for churches in Pacific. So the trustees responsibilities should be outlined, the church's values, mm -hmm. governance structure, powers, ministers roles and, and authority, 
um, trustees code of conduct, okay. office holders and powers, requirements for membership that would in, relate to your donors, etc. conflict of interest, complaints policy, leadership teams and structure, baptism and communi communion policies, wedding and blessing policies, um, dealings with, dealing with other faiths, partnerships with other bodies. So that's the sort of things that we should be covering. Wow. Thank you so much, Patsy. So I hope that answers your, uh, your questions. Um, I've got one more actually. So Susanna also says, can you explain more on fundraising for churches, um, e.g. the benefits? Okay, uh, okay. So uh, in respect to fundraising, Dominic, who is our head of fundraising, is really best placed to really answer that. And we can go into some huge depth, especially if you're, you're looking at things like not just delivering the project itself, but looking at things like capex expenses or capital expenses to help you to be able to deliver the project. So there's a wealth of experience that, that um, our head of fundraising will have and we'll be able to talk about those things. But surely the, the, the benefit of, of going down the road of fundraising for, you, for your church is the idea that you know, there are projects that are, that are deemed of real public benefit that allows that grant maker or groups of grant makers to achieve what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And they're achieving that through you, your local body, your charity, to be able to reach the masses because they themselves wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. But it is certainly something that is on their, their agenda to be able to deliver. Yeah, excellent. So uh, thank you both. Like literally why I love these webinars is because I think this is probably about our 10th but every time I speak to either of you, any of the experts we have on our team, I learn so much um, even. So, you know, I know that this has been extremely uh, valuable for those of you who have joined. So, you know, we've just really touched on the surface, like 25 odd years experience that these two members of our team have, you can't even begin to touch on that in 60 minutes. So I definitely, definitely encourage you to go to our website and request a consultation. A member of our team will absolutely be in touch with each one of you to see how we can support you further. In fact, I've just seen another question pop up. Just in the nick of time, we have three minutes. So uh, this question, how much would Good to Give charge to organize an awareness training for our board of trustees? Okay, uh, I think that's, um, that's certainly something that we would, we would take off, offline to be able to, um, to, to do that. I mean, most of our, most of our sessions um, prior to COVID, obviously, were, were run internally. Um, and so we would have, we would, hand those out to a number of clients and they'd be able to come in and join an, an online, you know, a classroom based setting. Um, but if you, if you wanted something which was specific to you know, your church and your trustees, certainly that's something that we would happily put together and is well within the sort of portfolio. It depends on distance, where we are, what we, and, or whether or not we're delivering that on, online. But for anybody interested in that, we'll happily take that offline and sort of discuss that with you. Absolutely. And just to say on that, I know the person that has submitted that is an on anonymous, but if you would like to send me a message directly with your email address, I will make sure that a member of our team does get in touch with you um, after this webinar. Final question, two minutes to go. Can you fundraise for other churches in Jamaica? Um, right. So it's something that Patsy touched on earlier, which was, um, uh, I, I hope to be able to uh, remember it correctly, but where you have linked organizations. Uh, I see all too many um, churches that, or in actual fact, charity organizations do not, who do not speak about the links that they have with other organizations, or uh, it's not as part and parcel of their objects and in their governance to be able to share um, either you know, data or, 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 or even funds with other organizations. So, before you can even think about you know, raising money to send to other entities, other countries and so on, it needs to be part and parcel of what your charity actually is mandated to do. 
after that, then yeah, not a, not a problem. Your charity can raise the funds that it needs to raise. The donors are aware of the objects, which are your aims and objects as a charity and where that money would be going. And there'd be no problem then with you being able to, again, good record keeping, where that money has been spent and the objects on which it's being spent for. That wouldn't be a problem. Okay, great. And I guess a similar question from Suan. Um, so do you help international fundraising organizations? I guess you've kind of covered that um, in, the, in, the, in your answer just now and they're still coming. So let's see, let's see. Um, okay. Um, okay, perfect. All right, that's fine. That's just a note to us. Um, so thank you all for joining us, for participating. It's a joy for us to share with you and just, you know, touch on our expertise. Like I said, a member of our team will be in touch with you. If you cannot wait for that, though, visit goodtogive.co.uk and contact us there. Also, just to let you know, as soon as I close out this session, there will be a survey. Please, please do um, complete that survey. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, always wanting to make these events um, even better than they are. So please do give us um, your feedback and a member of our team will be in touch. Um, uh, just a comment here from Angela. Do you uh, a date to run this webinar? Again, this webinar will actually be in our YouTube channel. And so please, every one of you, please do follow us um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and you search Good To Give, you will find our channel. Subscribe there because all of these webinars are on that channel. Um, some, one, someone mentioned fundraising. In fact, a number of you did. We had a whole hour session from Dominic a couple of weeks ago, and that is on our YouTube channel. So please do go visit that page and subscribe so that you don't miss any of this content. Um, and I think, I, yeah, I think that's the last question uh, excellent thanks yes so that is it for the for today patsy des thank you so much for sharing your wealth of information also just to let you know we have our next webinar on what does a socially distanced church look like because a lot of us are wondering we have the information for you on that that's taking place on the 28th of July. So please don't miss out on that. And I will send you details in the follow up email. So that's it from us. And uh, we will speak to you again soon. Bye bye. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Take care. Bless you.